All right, so hey everyone, and welcome to our presentation about evaluating superhuman models with consistency checks. Uh, presented by me, Lucas, um, it's co authored by Daniel Palecka and Florian Traumer, both from ETH Zurich. So I'm pretty sure that all of you have seen something like this during the past few years. AI models have made staggering progress in a wide range of different fields, and there is no end in sight, so they're only getting better. However, with their increasing cap capabilities, there also come some downsides. They get deployed, maybe without being tested enough, and as a result, we get like a bunch of different failure cases, like the ones you see here that have been popping up during the last few years. And in order to prevent this, we try to evaluate our models. So we try to test them before deploying them in order to be absolutely sure that stuff like this doesn't happen. And now the issue is that once our AI systems get sm uh, smarter and smarter, evaluating them becomes more and more difficult. Mainly because in many areas we don't have a ground truth for evaluating our AI models. So let me give you an example. Um, chess AIs are already since, since a few decades outperforming humans by a, a big margin on their tasks. And so let's assume that the chess AI is proposing you that this is actually the only best move to play in this position. How do you actually know whether this is good or bad? The AI system is better than you by a lot, and so it most likely will know better than you. And there is no real ground truth in chess, at least it's infeasible to compute, and therefore we're sort of left in the dark. And very similar, let's assume that you have some AI language model, whatever, that will try to help you make forecasts for the future, and like you ask it whether the stock of TSML will fall below $75 in at for at least one full day before 2025, and then the AI will give you some probability. Again, like there's no real way to test this, to, to test the accuracy, the, how much you should trust this system. And so in our um, paper, we actually try to work on this question. So how can we actually evaluate the decisions made by superhuman models, especially in scenarios where we don't have any ground truth? And sort of the main insight that we're using is that it's actually much easier to check those AI systems for consistency than it is to check them for correctness. So let me show this again on the chess example. While we don't know whether this is actually a good move or not, one thing that we could do is sort of flip the board and give the white player the exact same position that the black player had there. And then we could ask the AI system again, right, what is the best move to play in this second position? And now, if the AI system suddenly tells you, oh, actually, the best move is moving this pawn one down and all everything else is like bad, then we know that something is fishy, right? We don't know exactly on which board the AI system made a mistake, but we know that the AI system is not or does make mistakes in predicting, uh, making predictions about this position, and we should probably be very careful about trusting its decisions in situations like this. And so this isn't a new idea, like using consistency checks. Uh, actually, already in the late 1990s, people started to use consistency checks to test or verify their software. And like later on, um, a famous example is also an image um, Processing where people test the robustness of their image models, like usually more robustness to different types of noises. And more recently, with the advance of language models, people started to try to use those consistency checks as well to test their language models. And so the method of representing this paper is basically an extension, looking at superhuman AI models as well as especially scenarios where there is no ground truth. And our method is very, very simple. We just need a domain, a problem domain, where we do have some relation on the input. So for example, that if we use those two positions, this is just mirrored in the middle, like upwards, then these two positions are exactly semantically equal, and the AI system should play the same move. I apologize, the board should be uh, different here. It should basically look like the one on the right hand side there. So as long as we have some relation on the input, which from which there must follow a relation on the output, we can actually apply our method. And uh, the nice thing about this method is that it is widely applicable to a wide set of problem domains. We don't require any ground truth, so the AI system can perform better than us at the problem. And it's possible to evaluate individual model decisions and not just like the performance of a model over a long time or multiple different inputs. And lastly, like we don't require any model assumptions. So this is a black box evaluation method. Right, so now in this paper, we I would like to first um, answer the question whether we can actually use this method to find failures in a few different application scenarios. Then I would like to show you results about, about how well these results scale to smarter models. And lastly, I'd like to show you some approaches how we can use these methods to find, or 
develop methods to find those failures more efficiently. All right, so in order to figure out whether we can actually use this method, whether this is any good, we tried it out for a few different um, application scenarios. The first one is the one I already introduced you, chess, where we basically looked at superhuman chess AI models. Uh, precisely, we used Stockfish and Leela AI, which is sort of the open source version of Alva Zero. And we did basically what I showed you before. So we developed several consistency checks. For example, a board transformation check. In this example, we simply rotate the board by 90 degrees. And since we don't have any pawns uh, on this board and there's no casting impossible, um, these two positions are precisely semantically equal. And this is actually one of the very few examples that we found where the AI system for some reason has a huge discrepancy in its predicted probability to, to win for the white player. Um, there are a lot of different um, collision sheet checks that you could do and also that we did. I'm just going to show you one more. Um, that one is sort of called the re recommended move consistency check. Um, and it sort of bases its assumption on the fact that if your AI system tells you that this is the only good or the only good move to play in order to have like a 68% probability to win, after actually playing that move, we should expect that this probability doesn't change too much. Because again, this was the main assumption for making this prediction here. But again, this is one of the few examples we found where the AI system completely messed up and ran into like, uh, I think it blundered the, comp uh, the entire game away. And so just to show you also some quantitative results. So we basically sampled a few hundred thousand random chess positions. We tested them on four different consistency checks. And then we basically computed these violation scores. Um, just to give you a brief explanation, this chess AI is basically outputting a number between minus one and one, where minus one um, corresponds to a loss and one corresponds to a win. And then we basically only look at positions which are semantically equal. And so the score should be equal. And therefore, we compute the violation score, which is basically just the, the subtraction of the two scores. And this will result in a number between zero and two, where like zero is perfect consistency, so no failure at all, and two is like the maximum possible violation. And so our first finding is that in a large majority of cases, we actually, or these superhuman AI systems are very consistent. So they have no two, like almost no consistency issues. However, for all of our test the consistency checks, we were able to find these small violations um, or these rare cases where they are actually messed up. And so yeah, after evaluating chess systems, we moved on to another application domain, namely forecasting future events. And for this, we actually used GPT-3 and GPT-4 in order to make predictions about the future. And then we tested um, them on consistency constraint to find out how much we can trust these predictions. And so our first consistency constraint we used was negation. So we asked like GPT, for example, will over half of the US Senate be women in 2045? And then we also asked it the opposite. So will less than or equal to half of the US Senate be women in 2045? And like, we don't know the probability of this event, but what we do know is that the probability of, of the sum of those two probabilities should sum to one. And therefore, all our predictions should be like on this y equals one minus x line. So if the probability that half of the US Senate by 2045 is women is 80%, we would expect there to be a 20% chance that there are less than or ha uh, equal to half of the U US Senate to be women. Um, another interesting consistency check that we tested is monotonicity. So in this case, we look at time series that are monotonic. So for example, how many people will have climbed Mount Everest by 2030? And then the same question again for 2040. And while we do not know those numbers, we do know that the number can't go down, right? It always has to say the same or go up. And in that way, we were able to test GPT on a, like a, a wide range of different of those um, monotonic series. And you can see in many of those cases, GPT actually failed and was like, provided inconsistent responses. And lastly, I would also like to show you that we were able to, to make this quite more complicated. So for example, we could check Bayes' rule, where you basically just need two events, like will the Republican Party win the US presidential election? And will the Republican Party win the popular vote in the about presidential election. And then you could ask or query the GPT models for those four probabilities and check whether Bayes' um, law uh, actually or Bayes' theorem holds. And as you can see, this is a sp particular example where both GPT-3 and GPT-4 messed up really badly. So like more than 60% in both uh, cases of the answers were inconsistent. And so can we find failures with our method? The answer is yes. So in most cases, especially for superhuman models, um, the models are very consistent in general, but we are able to use our method to find failures, but they're rare. And so in the next um, step, we asked how well do these results scale? 
what happens if these models get smarter? Will it get easier or harder to actually find those consistency errors? And so we started to do an analysis with chess. And there we basically took our uh, Leela chess model and made it basically think or evaluate the position for longer. And this actually corresponds to being a stronger model. So the ELO of the model goes up, the, the longer it is allowed to think about a specific method. And you can see all of our inconsistency thresholds go down with increasing model strength. So making the chess model smarter actually makes consistency failures or makes us finding consistency failures rarer. Um, we did a similar comparison between GPT 3.5 and 4. And you can see for all our, um, or most of our consistency checks, GPT-4 does provide better performance than GPT-3.5 on our consistency cases, with the exception of Bayes' rule that I talked about earlier, where both models are still failing to provide any reasonable um, performance. And so in the last step, we ask ourselves, okay, so we saw that the failures are getting rarer, right? So maybe they're just harder to find, right? Because we're randomly testing methods, right? We're randomly sampling chessboards and randomly generating these tests for the language models. Is there some way that we can find those consistency violations faster, like more efficiently, especially like in cases when they are very rare? And we looked at two um, different approaches of how this could be done. So first we looked at the black box optimization approach. There we don't actually have access to the model itself and can only evaluate input-output correlations. And we basically used a genetic algorithm to sort of make small changes to chessboards in order to try to find the direction of increase of the inconsistency and then optimize in that direction. And this worked out pretty well. So on the very first line, you can see uh, our early results where we just randomly sample chess positions. And uh, the lower three lines are actually three different runs of our adversarial methods. And we were able to find like 8x to 20x more inconsistencies using this black box um, evaluation approach. And then in the second step we used, uh, we tried to look into white box optimization methods. And because we either didn't have model access, like in the case of GPT, or the, the model is not entirely reliant on neural networks, like in the case of the chess AIs, but also performing some uh, classical search, we actually um, switched to a small toy environment, or a toy problem, if you will, um, the problem of making legal decisions. This is one other domain where it's really hard to actually make predictions. So lawyers and judges, they spent months, if not years, debating a case in, fr uh, in front of a court. Uh, before they actually come to a decision whether uh, a uh, law has been violated or not. And there have been popping up some AI systems which claim that can, they can make these predictions, so they can actually take in a case, an entire legal case, in natural language form, and then sort of try to make a prediction whether, in this case, a uh, human right was violated or not. And so what we did here is like we, we took a single sentence or a single case fact from this case, and we paraphrased it. And after that, we inserted the paraphrased fact and let the model decide again on whether a human right has been violated or not. And this is actually one of the examples where the model flipped its decision from human right violated to not human right violated. And sorry, this is a, a bit of a detour, and the reason for that being that we used this to test our white box um, attack. So on the left, you can see uh, our results when we just used a random paraphrasing fact, so when we just used one of those random facts to paraphrase. And on the right, you can see the result when you use the most important case fact. And most important in the sense that the model attributed the most importance to this in single case fact. So paraphrasing that case fact led to much worse results. You can see it on the x-axis, the probability of a law being violated in the original case, and on the y-axis, the probability of a law being violated in the paraphrase case. And so ideally, those should be exactly on the x-y-axis, and as you can see, we were able to find a large number of um, violations in this case. That being said, small caveat, this is not GPT-3 and 4 as before. This is a, a more smaller model that we used from this uh, NLP for law domain. All right, so in summary, um, AIO models operating in domains without ground truth are hard to evaluate, and this problem will most likely only increase in the future as more and more AI systems um, get smarter than us humans. Um, we developed a method using consistency checks to find, to still being able to find errors in these models. And we showed that it's actually possible to apply this method to a like, wide range of domains in order to find failures in these models, even if they are rare. We did some scaling analysis in order to figure out whether these, this method also works for smarter models. And it showed us that actually um, the smarter the model gets, the harder it gets to find these consistency errors. And so in the last step, we developed two different methods, how we could sort of improve the efficiency of our methods. So we, we switched away from random search to some directed search, either in a black box or a white box manner. 
and we were able to show that this actually increases the amount of errors uh, that we can find. All right, so I'm at 50 minutes. This is the end of my presentation. Thank you very much for attending, and I'm open for any questions you might have.